Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> I'm not even going to bother to introduce myself again because I've done it too many times this weekend. Um, this is going to be a very special presentation. Uh, I know that because I've known Rob for a very long time and uh, he has quite an exceptional uh, brain and quite an exceptional understanding of what is going on in the Amazon at the moment amongst many, many other things. Um, Rob is the founder uh, with his wife, Ilona Sabo, who's Brazilian, of um, <coughs> one of Brazil's most outstanding think tanks. He calls it a think-and-do tank, uh, Igarapé. Um, he has concentrated for many years on um, uh, urban violence, uh, on security issues, uh, on the Amazon, and on a host of other subjects. He is also the co-founder of a company called SecDev in Canada, which does a combination of network uh, analytics and open intelligence source uh, analytics, predicting strategic risk uh, around the world. Um, he has got a presentation for us this afternoon on the Amazon and then I'm going to be talking to him after that. And in particular, appropriately, since Brazilians are, as we speak, going to the polls, in one of the most monumental, sorry, mon, uh, monu what's the word? Momentous is what I'm looking for. Momentous elections, not just of this year, of which there are many, but of the decade, and if not longer. And Rob and I will endeavor to explain why? So, without further ado, let me hand you over to Rob and his talk on the Amazon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks uh, so much, Misha, and to the Institute for this invitation and for two extraordinary days of um, thought and reflection uh, about uncertainty. And I, I found myself, and I'm sure you all have as well, uh, transfixed by the war that's currently ongoing between Russia and Ukraine and the potential for catastrophic escalation. That indeed has been perhaps the subtext for the last two days. For the first time in a generation, uh, we're discussing the prospect of a nuclear exchange. Um, and while the prevention of nuclear weapons must receive our undivided attention, there's another kind of bomb we need to worry about. This one is quietly ticking in the Amazon rainforest. And while not as spectacular as an atomic bomb, its impacts are, I would argue, no less consequential. If this climate bomb is detonated, it won't go off all at once, and its effects won't be immediately felt. But the global implications of this bomb, let me just grab something quickly here. Just wrong notes. <laughs> what are going to be felt more gradually, and the implications for global climate and biodiversity will last a generation. So what might happen if this bomb goes off? First, it would release between 60 and 80 billion metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere over a series of decades, speeding up global warming. Second, it would degrade the world's largest carbon sink, reducing the Amazon's ability to retain carbon, but also to produce oxygen and water. Third, this climate bomb would hasten mass extinction events, not just in the Amazon, but in many other parts of the world as well. Fourth, it would speed up the collapse of the Gulf Stream, which you can see sort of nestled next to the southern part of Latin America, uh, and other Atlantic currents. The combined effects of these rising emissions and temperatures would short-circuit monsoons and endanger 
Antarctic ice sheets. Among so many other things, the bomb would destabilize the planet's agricultural producers, deepening global food insecurity for literally billions of people. There are basically two wires we need to clip or defuse this bomb. The first is to prevent and reverse global warming, for which we have a Paris climate agreement, as all of you know. The second is to end deforestation, for which we don't have any serious treaty and around which we don't have robust leadership. So how much time do we have before this potential bomb goes off and we see the Amazon become a net carbon exporter? According to the leading climate scientist, Your Carlos Nobres, Pardon me? Your Mac's not charging. Oh. I don't think so. Watch out if it goes out. Oh, that's oh. interesting. <clears throat> Averting another kind of bomb right there myself. <laughs> so how much time have we got before this bomb goes off? According to the leading climate scientists, Carlos Nobris and the late Tom Lovejoy, if the Amazon reaches 20 to 25 percent of deforestation of its primary forests, the bomb will start to go. Right now, we think the Amazon's at about 19 percent of its primary forest being cleared. Some scientists believe that the bomb will be triggered in the coming decades. Others fear that the bomb may have already started to go off. And there's uncertainty about when this precise threshold will be reached, where tipping points will occur, and how intense those feedback loops are going to be. But what virtually everybody who studies this issue agrees on is that keeping this climate bomb from going off is in our collective, indeed, our planetary interests. So my organization, which Mish introduced, is working with governments, business and activists and scientists across the Amazon and around the world to try to defuse this bomb. In the process, what we've discovered is that this means confronting, often headlong, the shadowy world of criminal networks and practices that drive deforestation and degradation to begin with. This is really risky business. The Amazon today is the most dangerous place in the world for environmental activists and human rights defenders. Colleagues of mine and friends have been killed in the process of trying to document and confront environment crime. Most recently, and perhaps most widely recognized, is Dom Phillips, a journalist who worked with The Guardian, as well as indigenous rights advocate Bruno Pereira. But there are perhaps more obvious reasons why the Amazon is a challenging place to work. As you can see, one of them is its sheer size. The Amazon is huge, seven million square kilometers. It spans eight countries, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, along with Bolivia, Ecuador, Venezuela, Suriname, Guyana, and French Guyana. It spans about half of all of South America. To put its size in perspective, the Amazon is larger than all of Western Europe. You could fit 80 Austrias in the Amazon and still have room for Switzerland. It dwarfs other biomes, like the Congo Basin, the Sunderland Rainforest in Southeast Asia, and others that you see. Another incredible feature of the Amazon is its diversity, captured memorably by Salgado, a famous photographer from Brazil. And the Amazon isn't just some undifferentiated mass of trees. It's made up of a mosaic of ecosystems, rainforests, seasonal forests, flooded forests, and savannas. It's home to 60% of the world's tropical forests. 20% of all fresh water resources that we have on this planet, an estimated 10% of all of our biodiversity that's been recorded. Biologists believe that there are up to 10,000 different species in the Amazon, uh, including tens of thousands of plants, thousands of trees, birds, and other species. And this just scrapes, we think, the surface. In just the past four years, over 600 species of plants and animals have been discovered. And it's not just flora and fauna. The Amazon is home to over 30 million people, including 400 indigenous groups and others of African, European, and mixed descent. The first people to inhabit the Amazon are believed to have settled there thousands of years ago, well before Europeans arrived in 1541. When Francisco Pizarro came looking for the mythical city 
of El Dorado for gold. He started a literal and metaphorical gold rush that continues to this day. And the Amazon forest is wet. For any of those of you who've been there, you know it's extremely wet. Its most famous river, the Amazon, is the world's largest in terms of discharge and the second largest river in the world after the Nile. There are over a thousand different tributaries that crisscross the Amazon that are the lifelines of the forest. And then there are these flying rivers captured again, memorably, by Salgado. As all of you know, trees release vapor, and that in turn is distributed as rain. This is 101. What you may not know is that each tree in the Amazon releases about 1,000 liters of water every single day. What that means is that the Amazon releases up to 20 billion metric tons of water daily, the equivalent of 8,000 Olympic swimming pools. Without these extraordinary mechanisms of water production and circulation and transportation, Brazil and the Amazon would be desert. Now, if we fast forward to today, there are signs that some of these systems are starting to fail. They're experiencing what scientists call dieback. When temperatures rise and forests are cut down, the risk of dieback increases. Many of you, I think, in this room would be familiar with this phenomenon. Uh, it's called, and I'm going to massacre the German here, but I think it's called Walsterben, if I'm not mistaken. And Walsterben occurred in Germany throughout the 70s and 80s when it affected half of all trees. It seems to have returned to this part of the world in recent times. Nowhere is dieback moving more swiftly than in Brazil, home to roughly 60% of the forests of the entire basin. In Brazil, the key driver of dieback is deforestation and degradation. Satellite data reveals that almost a fifth of the original growth of the Brazilian Amazon has been removed. Compare this to the 1970s, when it was less than 1%. Over the past four decades, the building of the Trans-Amazonian Highways the migration of settlers and the expansion of agriculture, cattle herding and mining all played a key role. I want you to take note of these two roads that run east-west and north-south, in particular the 319 and the 230. Sorry for those at the back who may not see that. These were major road-building projects started in the 1970s during a period of Brazilian expansion and colonization of the Amazon, and they coincide perfectly with the industrial-scale deforestation of the interior of the Amazon. And it's not just roads that are contributing to deforestation. What you have here is over 1,200 unregistered airstrips scattered across the region. Where there are airstrips, there are mines. Planes are able to reach where roads cannot penetrate, funneling fuel, people, equipment, and pulling out resources. They're contributing to a thriving illegal industry of gold mining, including on indigenous lands. We've documented at our institute over 320 illegal mines using a combination of satellite imagery and machine learning tools. And there are tens of thousands of artisanal miners, or garamperos, as they're known. Today, Brazil is a top 10, one of the top 10 gold producers. And yet a quarter of that gold is believed to come from illegally sourced mines. And all of this is contributing to pushing the Amazon towards this dieback. Of course, the story is more complex than this. It's helpful to think of the Amazon not as one massive biome, but as several distinct biomes, some more prone to dieback than the other. Most of the eastern and southern parts of the Amazon are already heavily deforested. 26 to 30 percent of the primary forest, we believe, have been cleared. And they've already started tipping over and now appear to be net carbon emitters. So they're no longer uh, siphoning out carbon from the air and producing more oxygen. They're producing more carbon dioxide than, than, than oxygen. And we can see the effects already in that part of the Amazon. Rainfall is slowing, and some ecosystems in these regions are transitioning to dryland forests and destabilizing feedback loops. By contrast, the western part of the Amazon, closer to the border of Colombia and Peru, well, it seems to be more intact. And while there are fewer obvious signs of tipping point in terms of declining rainfall or increasing dryness, it doesn't mean they're safe. 
And there is some cause for hope in this rather dire scenario, in that the Amazon rainforest is extraordinarily resilient and has the potential, if given the chance, to recover. But that won't happen. That is to say, hope won't <laughs> allow us to keep it from being pushed over the edge. The sheer scale of deforestation degradation in the Amazon is literally breathtaking. Over the past few years, Brazil has recorded the highest rates of deforestation in almost two decades. We're talking about 13,000 square kilometers a year, about 31 Viennas. Brazilian deforestation increased by 70% since President Bolsonaro took office in 2018. And it's not just Brazil that's re registering this kind of record-breaking deforestation. We're seeing similar kinds of patterns in the last couple of years in neighboring Bolivia, Colombia, Peru, and Venezuela. Most of it driven by an insatiable demand for global commodities. So let's talk about those commodities. Virtually all Amazonian deforestation is connected to global and domestic appetites for at least one of these four or five broad sets of commodities. Beef, agriculture, minerals, wood, and cocaine. Enemy number one in all of this is the creation of pasture for cattle. Brazil is the world's largest producer of beef, responsible for about a quarter of all global exports. Brazil's three biggest beef producers, JBS, Marfrig, Minerva, are truly genuinely global players. Brazil is also one of the largest suppliers of soy, accounting for about a third of global supplies. And soy is produced also by major agricultural powers, like Cargill, Bungi, ADM. Brazil is also experiencing staggering levels of logging, and this is often the first step in the clearance of forests. And we're seeing most of it being unauthorized and consumed locally, but also exported around the world. And the insatiable demand for raw materials, and we'll get into this, including copper, iron, gold, the vast majority of which is done on illegally sourced land, is produced in just is, is, is also legal and a big factor for deforestation. And then there's cocaine, most of which is produced in just three countries, Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia. But we're seeing that beginning to spread in neighboring countries, including in parts of the border of Brazil. The expansion of coca production, which is the key ingredient of cocaine, and the involvement of drug trafficking organizations is supercharging this kind of environmental crime. But here's the thing. Over 95% of all this deforestation that we have right now in the Amazon, it's illegal. Let me say that one more time. 95% of all forest clearances in the Amazon is criminal. And it's not just a few desperate land grabbers or ranchers or farmers or gold prospectors who are necessarily the, the, the chief culprits. Rather, there's a complex, what we describe as an ecosystem of crime, spanning Brazil, the Amazon, and indeed the world. And we need to focus on this whole ecosystem if we want to end deforestation. If we narrow the gaze to just one, be it the farmers and the ranchers in the upper left corner, or the customs officials in the, in the far right, or the business on the bottom right, or the truckers uh, and transporters on the bottom left, we miss the greater picture. Like all ecosystems, and sorry for this slide, <laughs> this one has many different parts. Of course, there are the people who cut down trees on the front line, most of them extraordinarily poor, although admittedly some are wealthy. There are also the road builders, the pilots, the truckers who move products in the bottom left. And then there are the thousands of investors who are bankrolling the criminal clearance of land and extraction of commodities, often knowing it's happening, but not intervening in the bottom right. There are the corrupt land registration officials and police and customs officials who dole out fake licenses, protect illegal assets, fast-track the export of ill-gotten gains. Environmental crime is also supercharged by sellers and wholesalers and traders who know that these markets are riddled with crime, yet turn a blind eye. These crimes tend to thrive, as you might expect, where you have high levels of impunity and chronic poverty, but they also have feedback loops on their own, corrupting local economies and normalizing cultures of illegality. No surprise, then, that many Amazonian cities 
are literally amongst the most violent in the world. So the Amazon's already difficult environmental crime problem is about to get a whole lot more challenging. That's because we have full-blown organized crime groups, including drug trafficking factions and mafia organizations that are getting into the game from Brazil, Colombia, and Peru, but also from Mexico, from Italy, the Balkans. Some of you may know them by name. The FARC, or the ex-FARC, which were a group of guerrillas in Colombia. The Ex-Shining Path, which was a guerrilla group and insurgent group in Peru. The PCC and the CV, who are the two most notorious gangs in Brazil. The Singaloa Cartel, the Zetas, and even the Cosa Nostra. These groups are diversifying their business, using sophisticated networks already used to push drugs and narcotics to push environmental contraband as well. And this is a very, very alarming development. Drug traffickers in each of these countries are not only well organized and extraordinarily well financed, they're also brutally violent. And they're very, very good at moving illegal products around the world. When a gram of cocaine is the same value as a gram of gold, it's no surprise that they're getting into this gig. And all this could set off an even bigger deforestation boom if we don't get our heads around it fast. Of course, environmental crimes don't happen in a vacuum. Illegal deforestation degradation thrives where the rule of law is weak and impunity reigns. Brazil, Colombia, and Peru, and other countries in the region are amongst the most violent in the world and have long struggled to manage command and control in the Amazon. Both the police and the military are understaffed and under-resourced. And many of those who are stationed in that vast area described often uh, are, are positioned in, a, in an exceedingly difficult situation where they almost have to be co-opted, otherwise they risk death. This is a really big problem. And scientific studies that are coming out just in the last year alone suggest that where you have the absence of law enforcement, it's strongly correlated with increases in deforestation, biomass burning, and degradation. National leadership is also in short supply. And this brings us to the elephant in the room, the far-right President Bolsonaro, who is in the midst of an election today. He's the son of a gold prospector and a former army captain, and he campaigned very much on an anti-environment ticket. He essentially declared war on the Amazon. And since 2019, He's disbanded protected areas and nature reserves and indigenous territories. He's provided amnesties for illegal deforesters and wildcat miners. He's defunded environmental and indigenous affairs agencies. He's staffed the same agencies with his loyalists. He's incited farmers and ranchers to set the fire, the forests ablaze. Now, you might find this somewhat challenging, even repugnant, but he has an extraordinarily strong support from rural voters, the big agricultural and mining sectors who've benefited handsomely under his tenure. Of course, he's also coming under heavy criticism, as all of you know. Activists around the world are condemning his environmental policies or lack of them. And some even say he's guilty of ecocide and possibly even a genocide, with groups petitioning to take him to the International Criminal Court. Given Bolsonaro's legacy, it's no exaggeration to say that today's election could decide the fate of the Amazon basin. It's really that serious. Bolsonaro and his opponent, Lula Ignacio da Silva, have radically different approaches to how they think about the Amazon. Bolsonaro promises to accelerate extraction and the dismemberment of whatever remains of environmental legislation. Lula promises the reverse, to achieve net zero deforestation by 2030, to crack down on illegal mining, to promote green jobs and a series of other proposals. Now, Lula is not the ultimate green candidate, let's be really clear. He's also promised to expand oil production and the building of major hydroelectric dams. But despite his flaws, Lula has a track record. As president, between 2003 and 2010, he and his environment minister, Marina Silva, dramatically reversed deforestation. To put their accomplishments in perspective, they dropped deforestation rates by over 80% between 2004 and 2004 and 2012. So what do they do? First, they crafted a strategy. The action plan for the prevention and control of deforestation in the Amazon. Seems kind of obvious, right? Second, they created vast protected areas, 88 indigenous territories spanning 
270,000 square kilometers. Third, they imposed a moratorium on soy. The agreement banned for a temporary period grain traders from purchasing soy grown on recently deforested land. Fourth, the Lula administration provided incentives to companies not to deforest, created a land registry, formed new parklands, and set up the world's leading monitoring system to track deforestation in real time. And finally, perhaps unlike the incumbent, they enforced the law. The country's environmental authority was empowered to penalize illegal deforestation. The indigenous authorities supported the, the forest custodians to promote these territories. Keep in mind, these measures weren't perfect. Even operating at full tilt, just a fraction of the fines that were imposed were ever paid. But the differences between the two are night and day. Now, even if Brazil were to introduce progressive deforestation policy tomorrow, there are still big risks facing the Amazon. And here we touch on some of the big themes of the last two days. The Russian-Ukraine war is one of them. Because Brazil is dependent on Russia and Ukraine for fertilizer, it's now actively exploring ways to increase domestic production. And a lot of that production would be taking place in the Amazon. Brazilian soy, wheat, corn, and beef producers are also gunning to replace Ukraine and Russia to meet global demand. And that, of course, means opening up potentially new land. And then there's surging interest in critical minerals. It's an old story, but it's been resurrected by Bolsonaro, including lithium and rare earths. And there are big reservoirs in the Amazon. So despite these extraordinary Herculean challenges ahead, there are a few green shoots of hope. First, there's growing regional and national awareness about the threats facing the Amazon. And that's important. Amazon countries are starting to band together, in some cases for the first time, to try to cooperate to reduce deforestation and have pledged to ramp up some efforts with the support from international development banks. For the first time, the Amazon was a key issue during the Brazilian election, an historic first. And it was a major issue in Colombia just a few months ago when they elected a new president. We're also seeing, in spite of, let's say, federal inaction, governors and mayors across the region agitating for action and showing up at international events like COP26 or in the boardrooms of some of the world's biggest companies. And most important of all, indigenous voices are starting to be heard. This is critically important. As indigenous guardians are the most important defense that we have against the criminal deforestation that's taking place. We're also seeing some global action, albeit in fits and starts. A lot of this began when Bolsonaro first came to power, and the Amazon experienced devastating forest fires back in 2019 that some of you may remember that captured global headlines. Some of the actions that are, being taken that are taking place involve sticks. <clears throat> the Norwegian and German government suspended a $1 billion Amazon fund shortly after the government took office, putting it on notice. But the European and the US also started calling for more to be done. For example, the EU just passed this year an anti-deforestation law that will ban products linked to deforestation, degradation, and human rights violations. And the US right now is considering similar legislation, a for forest acts bill that would hold global suppliers of meat, soy, wood, palm oil, and the rest accountable for illegal deforestation. And faced with divestment campaigns and consumer outrage, a group of over 250 investors with assets of more than $17 trillion have issued declarations to clean up their supply chains and eliminate environmental crime. Now, all this sounds great. Of course, it comes down to whether or not these laws and policies will be enforced. So my team right now is working with local civil society groups, with Interpol, with the UN Office for Drugs and Crime, with investors, with frankly whoever wants to get on board, to begin mapping these criminal networks that are driving deforestation. But we need more than just sticks to get to zero deforestation. We also need carrots. And this has to start with building a sustainable bioeconomy in the Amazon, one where people who live in the Amazon are really tangibly benefiting. There's a movement being led right now by scientists, local entrepreneurs, and investors uh, in business to stimulate sustainable agroforestry and pro-nature activities. We're also seeing a shift as governments and businesses are looking to invest in reforesting, restoring, and recovering forests and ecosystems. Private and international banks are ramping up support for green funds and nature-positive 
investment. And the potential for carbon and biodiversity credits and nature-based solutions is really, to use Misha's word, monumental. There are, of course, real risks, though, of greenwashing. Governments and companies will inevitably try to look like they're taking action while not actually really making an, a, an effort to cut their own emissions. So we need to make sure that we have ethical impact investing, including ESG, that is both measurable and accountable. We need criteria and standards that are linked to the realities on the ground. And that means ensuring that crime and illegality are included in the equation. Too often, they're not for fear of reputational risk and other anxieties. Given the scale of this challenge, it's easy to fall into this trap of despair and to do nothing. And that would be precisely the wrong thing to do. I think we fundamentally need to reimagine the Amazon. And so I think for the next part of our conversation, we'll talk about how we can do that. Here we go. Well, you go down. Sorry, I think I want to be over here. <laughs> Rob, thanks for another cheery presentation. I tried to be cheery. Um, so uh, there was when Bolsonaro came to power, we started in in Brazil. There was a uh, a saying that uh, started to spread around, which is, um, you can't do business on a dead planet, but there's a lot of money to be made on the way. This is fundamentally a problem of capitalism, I would have thought, um, because of our insatiable requirement and needs for commodities produced as cheaply as, as possible. Is there a way of intervening in that cycle um, in order to shift away from a commodity capitalism to a sustainable capitalism? I think there is, but not without uh, extraordinary challenges. Um, and I think there's currently an effort, and this perhaps gets to a cheery bit, in Brazil and some other Amazonian countries to try to shift the dial. Um, and it begins at, you know, it has many levels if you want to achieve this, um, but it has to begin in these countries themselves with a desire to start valuing standing forests over cleared forests. Um, and that's the, the very basic equation we need to start with. Right now, it's cheaper to clear a forest uh, and to uh, produce products than it is to uh, have a sustainable agroforestry industry or a sustainable bioeconomy. Uh, and I think that what's being recognized increasingly by a, a new generation of investors and entrepreneurs is that there are alternative pathways to be able to generate meaningful income and products that can service the global markets by, by choosing an alternate path and rewarding that. So one way that starts at the global level is through carbon credits and biodiversity credits and this idea that um, we can start thinking about offsets as one option so that we can value standing forests and support communities to be able to maintain them. Another way is by working with companies in the agricultural industries and the pharmaceutical industries and the cosmetics industries to start creating value chains and value added to their products and support getting these products to market through last mile investments um, so as to help spur them on. And we're seeing that. Companies like Natura, for example, which is a leading um, product seller uh, of cosmetics, is one of the global leaders when it comes to getting sustainable products from the Amazon into global markets. But that requires investment. That requires you know, careful investment in supporting communities so that they're rewarded for keeping forest standard and they're rewarded meaningfully for the products they produce. Um, it also requires, as I was sort of stressing in the presentation, leadership. You need to have leaders at the national, state, and municipal level who are prepared to sort of invest in these sort of patient capital approaches and to look at this as a viable alternative. And I think we're starting to see that happen. Um, and part of that is because we have a global shift in the environment movement, a, a global shift in consumer demands and expectations, a global shift in climate finance, and we have treaties now that are emerging that are uh, compelling industry and governments to take the right path. Um, but I think also we have a, a younger generation that are recognizing the intrinsic value of the standing forest and also looking for different paths than the old one. 
So I think you have to think about it at a global level, at a national level, and of course, locally. Now, you mentioned leadership. You mentioned that on more than one occasion. You and I were spending a lot of time in Brazil in the run-up to the last election in 2018, and uh, in particular, once Lula had been uh, arrested, pretty much what we agree is a bit of a stitch-up and was out of the race, we were very, very concerned about Bolsonaro coming to, coming to power. But as you pointed out, he has a very significant power base institutionally uh, inside uh, Brazil. And although it looks as though that's coming to an end now, it's like Trump lost the election, Trumpism is still around. And uh, given the connections between Bolsonaro the uh, illegal forest, uh, deforestation forestation, um, operations, and indeed, as you know, organized crime, is the defeat of Bolsonaro, should he lose at today's election or in the runoff in two weeks' time, is that an end to the political problem driving deforestation? No. I mean, deforestation precedes Bolsonaro. In fact, there were higher levels of deforestation in the 90s and early 2000s, um, you know, before the major intervention of Lula and Marina Silva in the mid-2000s. Um, you have a really interesting scenario right now in Brazil of two candidates uh, who are the, the giants, the colossus uh, on, on the political stage, uh, who are both intensely reviled <laughs> by the other sides, but also command extraordinary loyalty. Uh, from their core supporters. So there's a very strong rejection rate of both, but there's also a very strong supporting uh, base of both. Um, and that, I think, tells you a lot about the state of Brazil right now. The, the moderate middle, um, and keep in mind there are more than 30 parties in Brazil, the moderate, more centrist parties, either center-left or center or center-right, were essentially obliterated uh, by these, this very uh, this clear movement on both sides, and Brazil separated almost into two tribes. Um, and that makes it very difficult to come up with let's say, more sensible type policies. The other, I guess, missing middle of Brazil, though, is that the real power brokers in Brazil when it comes to virtually all policy <laughs> is this group called the Central, which is a group of political parties that essentially don't have a clear ideological position other than the improvement of their own well-being. Uh, they exist essentially to... Uh, move pork from one place to another while pa padding their own pockets. They're known in Brazil as a physiological party because they literally exist off the state. Uh, and so whoever controls the executive has to work with this central and has to buy off their support in one way or another. So even if we have uh, a Lula victory and the election will be decided potentially tonight, and if not tonight, be decided at the end of October in a second round, um, either candidate will have to contend with uh, trying to move this central group of congressmen and women uh, towards particular positions. And there'll be a lot of trade-offs, so you will not be getting even remotely the optimal policy. Um, I think one thing we can be sure of, though, is that if Bolsonaro is, uh, wins the election, um, <laughs> we can expect more of the same, at the very least, perhaps even a more aggressive effort to expand uh, opening up of the Amazon, including indigenous areas, the introduction of decrees and bills and laws and legislation to try to expand uh, occupation of, of the area. Uh, under Lula, we have the potential to start changing the game. And what's interesting is just before this election, Marina Silva, who had broken with Lula, but was the environment minister who famously worked with Lula on getting those deforestation rates down, joined back up um, with Lula uh, under the condition that he accept her environmental plan, which mirrors very much the plan that she had 15 years before. And she brings with her a certain support network as well. So I think that to get to your, your question, though, in terms of beyond the election, um, and let's say we have a Lula victory, uh, Bolsonarismo, as it's called, I think is here to stay, uh, at least for the, the short to medium term. Um, the country is bitterly divided. He has tapped a vein of frustration 
uh, he's tapped the evangelical Protestant community with a culture war argument. He has tapped the rural vote and the mining vote and the agriculturalists in the country. He has uh, rewarded his policing uh, supporters um, uh, and, and, and those in the, in, in the military. Um, and so I think that he does command uh, a core group of supporters. And more than that, he has a number of sons, four sons to be specific, three of whom are in politics, one of whom is a very, very well, two of whom are quite popular politicians, and who I would argue in a manner of, say, another well-known president um, might carry that legacy forward after Bolsonaro is gone. The last thing I'll say about this is that Bolsonaro said something quite chilling uh, before this election. He said, there's only three ways I, I go out uh, of this. Either I win, or I go to jail, or I die. So for Bolsonaro, this is existential. Rob, before I throw it over to the audience, I want you to give them a sense of violence in, in Brazil. Because uh, if you haven't been there, and if you haven't experienced the insecurity that you feel just walking around the streets in Brazil, let alone what goes on in the Amazon, and perhaps you could finish off that that question about explaining why you and Ilona, your wife, decided to, hmm. decided to leave Brazil after the election of Bolsonaro? So, Brazil is the most violent country in the world in terms of absolute numbers of homicide. There's virtually no dispute. Um, and violence, as you'd expect, in Brazil, like any other country, tends to be quite concentrated in specific places and among specific people. Uh, but the cities, and Brazil is a very urbanized country, tend to be where a lot of the violence is concentrated typically because of a very rapid process of urbanization, uh, uh, high levels of inequality, um, you know, other forms of a big demographic sector of, of, of young, unemployed, often poorly educated, uh, young people with limited prospects. Uh, so you have a high concentration of lethal violence among black Brazilian, the black Brazilian community uh, in particular. Um, and it, it varies from place to place, uh, but I think what you could say is that violence is quite entrenched. Uh, it's become almost normalized in Brazil. There's almost an uneasy acquiescence with the status quo at one level. Um, and it, it's, as you say, it's, it's not just homicide. It's, uh, non-lethal violence, it's assault, it's burglary, it's carjacking. Virtually every Brazilian will have a story uh, about a family member or relative who's experienced violence. And that conditions a lot of the public mood. And it's, it's a conservative country in many ways. Um, get away from that image of the uh, samba dancer in Copacabana. This is quite a culturally conservative uh, country. And so there's a tendency to support uh, strong, heavy, hard-on-crime approaches. Um, and so that also explains part of the appeal of a Bolsonaro or um, others of his, of his ilk, in that he promises to bring security and safety to a country that feels, in many cases, traumatized by uh, legacies of violence. And this violence is, passes through generations. It passes through families. It's very difficult to escape it, because it's so tied with the spatial inequalities of that country. Um, and so, yes, we, we experience it. And so we, at our institute, we spend a lot of our time working on those issues that are really antithetical to many of those that Bolsonaro has been pushing. And this gets the, the, the part of your second question, which is that we work on issues of, of responsible gun control. We work is, on issues of uh, penal reform. We work on issues of drug con control policy and uh, responsible drug policy. All issues, um, one could argue, are antithetical to the Bolsonaro position, which is to liberalize uh, access and ownership and carrying of firearms in the most homicidal country in the world, uh, to ex uh, come, come down heavily on and incarcerate everybody and throw them into, into jails, especially young, black, impoverished uh, boys from, from the favela. Um, and so this put us at odds with Bolsonaro's agenda. And because we have some prominence in the country, and because my wife, Ilona, is a person of some renowned as a columnist and for one of the major news outlets and was on television regularly, put us in a confrontation. Now, I've known Bolsonaro for a long time, for about 20 years, I and mean, this is no outsider. Bolsonaro <coughs> has been in politics for over 30 years, even though he positioned himself as an outside candidate. So we kind of knew what we were getting into with Bolsonaro. But I think what, oh, that's probably Misha's phone, or somebody's that, phone. 
So I think, I think we knew what we were getting into um, when it came, it came to this character. Uh, and in fact, my wife debated him when she was in her early 20s uh, at a forum um, where he publicly denounced her and other women on the, on the stage. And so we saw these uh, clownish antics, which of course we later learned would be instrumental to uh, summoning up his, his hardcore supporters. Um, so anyways, the, the long and the short of it was that we were on a sort of collision course with Bolsonaro, because while we were talking to the Supreme Court and congressmen to think about tightening up uh, gun controls because we considered them to be too lax, he was issuing 40 to 50 decrees to try to essentially uh, break down the legislations uh, around responsible gun, gun ownership. Um, what happened was that uh, we were invited by his then Minister uh, for Justice to join a council uh, in the early days of the administration, a voluntary council, to talk about um, responsible approaches to uh, crime reduction and, and public safety promotion. And this minister had been granted a fair bit of authority um, and was one of the most popular politicians in the country because he was the one who'd been responsible for putting Lula away uh, and was being told that he, in fact, had super minister powers and had a high level of discretion. Um, when Bolsonaro and, more importantly, his supporters found out that this had happened, uh, and we fought long and hard about joining this council, but recognized as a civil society group that we have to keep some lines of communication open, recognizing that we we're going to be seeing wreckage around us in the coming weeks and months. When they found out, uh, a campaign began across the country, uh, denouncing uh, the Institute and my wife in particular, and it trended on Twitter and uh, sort of seized the country. And it was the first instance, I would argue, of when we saw um, a, a very pronounced uh, attack against a civil society organization. And I think many uh, who'd voted for Bolsonaro had thought he might be tamed, much as many who voted for Donald Trump thought that he might be uh, suppressed. Uh, and I think it was the first time people saw that this wasn't going to be business as usual. This was going to be a different kind of government. And we saw a sort of parting of the waters in Brazil, where people started to take sides. Uh, and people who'd maybe been a bit more agnostic uh, became a little bit more either pro or against uh, Bolsonaro. This then led uh, to a campaign, I think many people in this room probably have experienced this, of harassment, of um, an online uh, campaign, often uh, you know, quite violent in, in, its, in, its, um, <laughs> in its manifestations. Uh, and Rio is the source of Bolsonaro's uh, power, in a way. He's from Rio de Janeiro, uh, and Rio, without going too far into it, has a, let's say, a tradition, a history of quite extreme political violence. So people started showing up at our front door, and we started getting advice from uh, around the world suggesting it might be time uh, for us to take a bit of a breather. So uh, again, with great sadness and remorse and uh, mixed feelings, um, we, we stepped out for a while. Uh, partly, I think, to ensure the integrity of our institution uh, and to ensure that it could persist and take the air out of this balloon, but also, I think, uh, out of recognition that this is hardball. Rob, I'd like to throw the, um, for the final 10 minutes, throw the uh, session open to the audience. So anyone got any questions about the Amazon or about Rob's experience? Lady there with her hand up. I'm not even sure if I should thank you for making me so depressed, but it was a very good presentation and uh, very, very insightful. Uh, but given the rather gloomy picture you painted of Brazil in general and the situation in the Amazon and the tremendous uh, danger uh, for people who get involved in such projects, who can one, yeah, who do you think one could um, attract, if that's the right word, uh, to taking up the gauntlet and to taking up the cause of the Amazon? I can't really see that there's much hope uh, for people, um, given all the, the difficulties you mentioned? No, thank you. It, it's, it's a, this is the question. It's a very, very challenging environment, and, and I think mostly for those who live there and who are on the front line. Um, and I'm speaking here about indigenous uh, rights defenders. I'm speaking here about communities that are uh, lacking in any uh, real protection. Um, I, I suppose what I'd say is that the... <laughs> the sustained attention to the Amazon, rather than the episodic concern, I think is a starting point. Uh, the Amazon has come up every other decade as an 
area of concern when we see fires burning and the international community is seized of the issue. Um, and I think then it disappears and it gets replaced by another event. Uh, and I think what we're seeing more and more is a steady drumbeat of attention and concern. That's number one. Number two, with that, and I, I do have some cause for hope in all of this, perhaps faith is a better word, uh, in the individuals who are on the front lines and their capabilities, but is that we have um, a cohort of scientists, uh, of, of people who are doing really, really good work on trying to expose what is happening. And that's coupled with new technologies that are allowing us to see in real time the devastation that's being wrought. I think before we could close our eyes and there'd be a cross-sectional study and we'd come back to it you know, a couple of years later. Today, you can't avoid. I mean, there's real-time satellites that are pinpointing what's happening. There's a group called the Science Panel for the Amazon of more than 200 of the leading scientists from across the Amazon who are producing a, a kind of an IPC, IPCC of the Amazon, um, creating a regular drumbeat of concern. Um, I think the other thing I'd say that gives me maybe a little bit of hope uh, is, is that you have a, a, a generation of young leaders, of uh, especially at the subnational level, you know, governors and others. You have a generation of new investors, uh, I think, who are spurred on by global changes in climate finance and legislation and rulings. For example, the ones I mentioned, the European Union and the U.S., which have just started. So we'll see how they they act out. Um, who are coming together and are seized of the issue. Now, I'm not suggesting it's all, you know, everyone's on the same path. There are many companies here who are profiting mightily, but the costs and the reputational costs of persisting with this kind of behavior are going to start becoming more and more intolerable. Um, so I think you're seeing finance, you're seeing investment, you're seeing uh, some entrepreneurs moving in the right direction, new equity funds being set up, new ways of capitalizing on a more sustainable uh, approach to, to investment in the Amazon. But I don't want to suggest that it's going to be easy. Um, the, what brings me more anxiety is the speed at which deforestation is taking place, the short period of time that we have before things completely tip over. So we have to do a lot very quickly, and we need big, bold ideas. You know, so there are people who are talking about not just a million trees or a billion trees, a trillion trees in the Amazon. Let's create a green corridor that spans uh, the axis north-south. There's people talking about setting up an MIT for the Amazon to cultivate science and laboratories and, and, and work on these supply chain issues I was mentioning. So I think that the ideas are coming and the capital is increasingly becoming available. The question is, can we mobilize it fast enough? Okay. Yeah. Yes, then. Here. Thank you very much for this very rich talk. Um, my question would actually um, concern our world, the Western Hemisphere, and the energy transition that we are currently um, having, and uh, the connection to the Amazon, because Amazon Watch has just recently published Complicity in Destruction, where you have about, I think, 2,200 mining um, sites or applications running. And if they would have been approved, uh, you would have to deforest a size of approximately the UK in the Amazon for the minerals that we kind of need, right, in the Western Hemisphere. And the problem is that um, this is, uh, you know, backed up by, for example, US-based hedge funds. So I was wondering if you could tell a little bit more how we can get out of this conundrum and how, what, how do you see the future in that? Thank you. Boy, uh, much depends, I think, on what happens in the next six, seven hours, um, <laughs> or possibly by the end of the, the month. Um, it's true that we have this paradox of uh, a green energy transition that requires a certain set or subset of critical minerals, uh, some of which were mentioned in one of the slides in rare earths, um, and that the very pursuit of these important minerals and rare earths uh, for the transition could in fact lead to more exploitation and extraction. Um, and so I think this is not just a problem for Brazil. This is a, a problem we're facing in, I think, virtually every part of the world. The challenge in Brazil, like say in Congo or other places where you don't have perhaps much regulation, enforcement and oversight is that um, this uh, can be even more damaging. Uh, now, Bolsonaro has issued, a, and it's not, a, it's not just Bolsonaro who was looking at introducing concessions and opening up mining. Um, previous administrations have talked about doing this. Uh, 
but Bolsonaro, I would say, took it to another level. He supercharged the issuing of decrees to try to open up mining, including in indigenous land and protected land, um, and removing a constitutional provision that would uh, limit the vetoing of some of these projects. So he's quite savvy in how to do this. Um, and yes, there's big money and big interest pushing, including from Canada, my country, where there's a number of big mining companies that are very much in this game. Um, I think B uh, Lula has come out fairly hard on this, um, suggesting that there would be absolutely no uh, extraction in indigenous land or protected areas, that in fact there might be more parks that would be issued, that there'd be more stringent legislation, but it still begs the question of how are we going to enforce that? How are we going to make sure that despite earnest pledges uh, and commitments in an area as vast and unregulated and, and unmonitored that can be done? So I think, again, I, I have to go back to suggesting that we have to build coalitions and constituencies around this to both push back against um, uh, sort of the, the kind of um, unrestrained mining that's being uh, suggested and being promoted and advocated for by, by uh, some in the Bolsonaro camp and those industries that are supporting it, uh, together with a much greater effort around transparency and accountability, um, and graded pressure on, on producers and consumers in this part of the world that we essentially decouple our supply chains from criminality. Um, so I think, I haven't fully answered your question, but I think it's much will depend on, I think, which way we go. Well, I think I can help there, Rob, because the IWM and the BBC has just produced a series called The Scramble for Rare Earths, which you can find on BBC Sounds and which, bizarrely, is presented by me uh, and includes at least two people in this room as uh, guests. So there you go. That'll uh, answer some of that question. Two more questions, one here and then one right behind. Kirst, you go first. Um, well, very quickly, um, and it, it connects to the last question, which is, um, if I was to buy a gold necklace or gold pair of earrings, is there any way I would know uh, whether they were sourced from illegally mined gold in the Amazon? And I guess I'm thinking of, I mean, many of us have seen the movie Blood Diamond. That was led by, uh, 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 we know that diamonds fueled the conflict in West Africa, and there was an excellent campaign led by the environmental charity Global Witness, um, to, which led to the Kimberley process so that you knew whether your diamond that you bought for your engagement ring or your wedding ring or whatever um, was, had blood on it, uh, so to speak. Is there, is there a similar um, process going on um, with 100 gold? 100%. It's a great, it's a great... Can we take two questions? Sure, why not take two? Thank you, Rob. Um, you've already partly explained, but what hangs in the balance today is partly this mining law that Bolsonaro has been um, championing. You've explained in your presentation a number of different drivers of deforestation and leading up to um, mining concessions in the Amazon. I'm curious to know whether or not you've been able to trace um, support, disinformation support going in the direction of Bolsonaro's campaign, which connect back to mining interests. Um, mostly, actually, I wouldn't necessarily, you, you, you'll tell us if it's associated to OECD country companies, but I'd be quite curious um, about the sources of information, disinformation coming from China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. So, Rob, you're going to have to be pithier than usual. And I know you're pithy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, and you know I will. So, I, I, on the gold question, um, there is action taking place right now. Gold is a highly... Uh, unregulated industry, and let's call it, it lacks sufficient regulations in Brazil. And it's, it's been almost deliberately kept so for all sorts of obvious reasons. Um, there is very little in the way of oversight and regulatory authority over the movement of gold, over the processing gold. Uh, in fact, many of the scripts and, and, and um, authentication procedures in which to process gold are done still by hand, um, hand signed. Uh, and so, within all of the gold chain, from the point of a concession to the point of, if you have a concession, the point of production and the extraordinary ecological damage that's, that's generated from that destruction, all the way through to the selling and then the, ultimately into the, into the market, there are a whole series of points in that chain where we can introduce very discreet interventions to increase the legibility or the visibility of what's happening in those transactions. Starting with, for example, having a digital system, perhaps even using blockchain, uh, to manage that process of 
registering and authenticating gold at the point of uh, processing and putting it into the formal market. Um, we're, we've been working with a number of groups and a number of indigenous groups have been leading this process uh, with the Swiss mining authorities. Now, two thirds of the world's gold goes through Switzerland at any given point, uh, in Lugano actually, who would have thought? Actually, you might have thought that. Um, <laughs> and, and it turns out that um, they haven't been particularly careful about tracing criminality across the gold chains. And they've now, the Association of Mining Authorities um, and Gold Mining Authorities in Switzerland have agreed uh, to introduce new standards and new protocols so that they're able to trace back uh, to, to gold across the supply chain. The challenge, as always, is that A, there's an enormous number of individuals involved. I mean, there are some big companies, but there's a lot of wildcat mining going on. Tens and tens and tens of thousands of people involved in the business. The systems that are there are not particularly robust, as you can imagine. Uh, and so there's going to be a big investment. And there are big lobbies to keep that kind of change from happening, which connects to an earlier point that one of our audience members made. Um, but I guess the point is that there is action, that there is this idea of blood gold um, that's currently now uh, taking hold. Uh, there are efforts to work, and including WWF and others are, are, we're going to be working with to set up a process with um, the, the, the bodies in Brazil that are responsible for regulating some aspects of those gold and increasing and improving their oversight. Um, and, and of course, there are these efforts globally uh, with some of the, the, the folks who are processing gold at, at, at the end point. So that's the good news. Uh, on, on issues of... Def uh, disinformation, I, I, this would be a longer conversation, but um, suffice to say that we, we, are, we are tracking disinformation, misinformation. I, we haven't been looking specifically, though, at, at, at Chinese-Russian um, campaigns around the mining sector, uh, but it seems like a really fruitful um, future line of work. Rob, what can I say? Uh, the work that Rob and many other people are doing in and around the Amazon is on behalf of uh, all of us, and so I'd like you to show your appreciation in an appropriate fashion after this terrific talk. Rob, thank you very much Thanks. indeed.